What's going on guys, Phil here from Phil's Craft Corner. Today I'm going to show you how I turned this understairs area that was just basically used as a dumping ground and I turned into this checker style understairs storage unit. If you've come here from the Facebook DIY pages or the Reddit DIY pages, welcome to my channel. Thank you for following along over the past few days of this build and thank you for all of your amazing comments. You've really made me quite proud, even more proud of the work that I've done. It was, it turned out great. So without further ado, I'm gonna get over to the PC. I'm gonna record a whole voiceover to this thing and you can hopefully follow along and maybe even build this yourself. So let's get into it. Okay guys, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the materials used. So I used four lamps of three by two, three sheets of 12 mil MDF, four packets of concealed hinges. These come in a twin pack. Uh, so that was eight hinges. I could have got away with using seven, but I had the eight, so I might as well have used it. Various screws. I used uh, some Spax 4.5 by 30 mils with this, and some gold screws 3 by 12 mils. A pack of four casters for the shoe drawer. Uh, two packets of L brackets. They come into in ten packs. Uh, I didn't use both packs, but I did need both of them. And the paint I used, I used Zinza BIN for the primer and undercoat. And then I used no nonsense satin paint. This is a quick dry satin water based. And that gives us a grand total of £146.64 for this complete job. So it's a lovely sunny day here in Blackpool today. And it's brilliant to be working outside. So I've got this temporary table set up just to be able to work outside. I'm sorry about the road noise, a very, very busy road right next to me. I'm just in the driveway so I can do all the cutting. Just cuts down on all the dust that's in the property. So the things we're gonna need are a good straight edge for spirit level. Um, I'm gonna be using my track saw today, but if you don't have a track saw, you can use a circular saw with a straight edge clamped down to the workpiece. An extension lead just to get the power out here. Uh, I'm using my Evolution miter saw for the bits of 3 2 and things like that, that I'm going to be using uh, just for the smaller cuts. It's only going to make probably about five or six cuts on this, hopefully. Um, I've got a jigsaw because I might need to notch out some bits for skirting boards and things like that. And I've got various screws, concealed hinges, some casters to put on a drawer for a shoe rack that I'm putting in there, and some L brackets to just secure things together. I'm probably just going to record the whole thing after this and then do a voiceover at the end just because it's a little bit easier and it's I can just carry on working then rather than coming back to the camera and talking about all the little bits and pieces and doing. If there's some specific tips at that exact moment I'll probably pick the camera up and show you and talk about that then but until then just uh, enjoy and listen to voiceover Phil. To start this project I decided that this little top square over here where a door wasn't going to be in because I'd have to notch it in for the newel post of the stairs um, I was just going to blank this off with a piece of wood just to make that a little easier and just have a straight cut across the top of the door rather than notching it out. So I took a couple of measurements there, uh, I went straight outside to the track saw, cut the piece for that and then came back to fit. These McAllister track saws come with 700 millimeter lengths of track and you can combine these to make a 1400 mil track like you see here and it's quite easy it's just these two black rods that tighten down with a couple of grub screws on the inside and that holds the track together in place for most of the other cuts on here i do leave it in the 1400 mil setup and it's just really easy when you're using a track saw, you want to make sure you measure from the left to the right and place your track on the left side of the cut. That way, when you line up your splinter guard, you get a perfectly accurate cut on that line and everything just fits nicely for you. As you can see, I already attached the L brackets to the back of the board. That way, I'm not trying to hold two things in place while I'm putting the screws in at the top. And this was so accurate that it just held in place by friction and that made it even easier for me to screw these into place. So I screwed one side into the newel post and then on the other side I made a little mark on the wall where I drilled and put a wall plug in the wall and then I could put 
put a screw through and hold it secure on that side too. So the next step was to start building the supports for the inside false walls and to do that I used a straight edge leaning next to the freebie 2 and I just marked the slope of the staircase onto the freebie 2 and went and cut it down on the miter saw. Once I had cut that down on the miter saw I could bring it back in and double check that it was level and then I could just secure it. To do that I put a screw through the top of the freebie 2 into the staircase and then I put an L bracket onto the bottom. One thing you need to be aware of when you are positioning this is you need to position it far enough back so that, so that the thickness of your door is going to be level with the staircase. In my case it was two 12 mil, so it needed to be 24 mil back from the edge of the staircase so that when the doors closed against it it was flush with the staircase as much as possible. To position the back support I measured both lengths from the back wall not including the skirting board I measured from the wall itself backwards and then again I measured the same further back at the back of the unit and that gave me the position I needed to measure up for the next length and cut that to size with the angle I also had to take into account the water pipe that runs across the back of the staircase and what I did to account for that is I cut the freebie 2 shorter and I just mounted it to the wall instead of mounting it to the floor. What I'm showing you here is how high I had to secure this to the wall just to be sure that I was nowhere near those gas pipes because that gas pipe goes back and into the wall. With those bits secure I could put the first face plate on and I needed to notch out these little grooves that were at the top of the stairs just so that this could fit flush with the top of the stairs as much as possible. So I notched out those areas and again for the skirting board at the back. Further add to the issues I was having, obviously the wall at the back isn't completely square so I lined the board up on that wall so it was flat on the wall and then I just marked up the front of this freebie 2 so then I could just cut along that mark with my track saw. This gave me a perfectly flush finish to the front freebie 2 so then I could secure it there and the doors are all going to fit flush and together. The next piece I wanted to put in was the false panel for the dooring. Uh, that was slightly bigger than the actual door itself so I lined this up roughly to where I wanted it to be and then again I just marked up on the inside where I needed to cut with my track saw. I took it out there, cut right along that line and then I brought it back in to fit it into place and once it's in place you want to have a gap on the right hand side on the freebie 2 overhanging you want this gap to be at least 24 millimeters because that's going to be the width of the door that opens up again I just secured these in place using my spax screws and just straight through the MDF the reason I'm using these spax screws is because you don't need to pilot them they're a, they're a self piloting bit and they have a cutting countersink so they cut into the MDF themselves as well so you don't need to mess with the countersink. After securing this freebie one to the wall and notching in this section I realised that I needed to cut this first part off because the door was going to hit against it so I used my multi tool to cut that off and while I was halfway through cutting this I then realised that a freebie one wouldn't be enough on this wall because when the door opens it's going to want to hit the door frame next to it. So I added another freebie one but you could just swap this out for a freebie two from the start and that would make things a whole lot easier for you. So the next step was to measure and cut for the first door and as you can see after a couple of attempts at getting this perfectly right it sits nicely in there and once the face frame's on and the hinges are in place that's going to open and close quite nicely. 
The next door was much easier for me to measure and cut for because I just needed to measure the front and the back and cut that angle on my track saw. As you can see I put the other false wall in. Uh, I didn't think you needed to see that part because it's exactly the same method as the first one. So the last one I needed to cut today was the front for the drawer. And to do this I placed the second door into place and then I marked off the top and the bottom parts of where the drawer was going to go. The reason I put the second door into place was so that I could align where the door was and then the drawer could cover up the majority of the rest of the space of that 3x2 that's the support. And that's it, that's the end of the first day. This took me around 7 hours to get to this point. Uh, I've just sat the doors in place with obviously the masking tape just to hold it in and I'm really happy with the results so far. This turned out really well. Tomorrow we'll come back, we'll put all the face frame on the doors, we'll hang the doors and we'll get everything prepped and ready for painting on day three. Alright guys, so we're back in my workshop now and I am building the shoe tray drawer to go in the last spot. So this is the maximum size that I've got to work with in that last spot. I've reduced that a little bit just to make sure I can make that fit in. And then I've reduced the height of either side by 10 centimeters just to account for the casters that are going on the bottom. Uh, I might put a shelf in the middle just to account for this little bit of height here. Uh, so you can put something underneath and then on the top as well. Um, should be all right. So we'll get over, we'll get these started to cut and we'll go from there. For the base of this one, I used some 18mm MDF that I had spare in the workshop. Uh, I used 18mm on the base because it gives it the casters something better to hold on to and the weight of the drawer isn't going to start making the 12mm sag. So I cut this down for the base size and then I used an offcut from the 12mm MDF to cut down for the back panel. I didn't need to cut the front panel because I already had that at the property ready to go. And then I just used this longer length to cut the sides for the box. With this piece being so small I clamped the piece down to the workbench because I don't actually have some track saw clamps at the moment. Uh, it's probably something I should get hold of in the future just to make things a little bit safer for these thinner cuts. After doing a quick test assembly I was quite happy with the results and I could get myself ready to do the full assembly. To assemble this I just used glue and brad nails to put everything together and hold it in place while the glue dried. I then marked 20cm up from the base in the corners and along the back for the shelf and I used some scrap pieces that I had lying around to cut out this shelf. To attach these pieces on the back I just used some mitre bond and quickly held these in place. These will hold plenty strong once that was done, I just used my table saw to rip all the remaining lengths of 12mm MDF into 3.5 inch strips. So we're back at the property and the first thing I did today was I put the wheels on the drawer. I measured 2 inches in from the sides and the top and the bottom, so it was quite square. And I just screwed them in with the 12mm screws that I had. To attach the drawer front what I did was I put my screw box in the back just to make sure the drawer stuck out at the front a little bit. I then put mitre bond across the front part of the drawer. I put my 3 mil spacers on the floor and then I offered up the drawer front to there. I lined it up visually at the front just to make sure there's enough space for the left and right and that the drawer would shut and then I sprayed it with the activator to hold it into place. Afterwards I came back with some L brackets on the back just to hold it in place more permanently. So this part was to show you how I make my shaker style doors. 
And to do that, I use the three and a half inch strips that I cut up at the workshop. I opted to do these shorter lengths first because the longer lengths, I didn't have enough to do the full height of the door. Traditionally, you should do the longer lengths first because that's how they are made properly uh, with the proper shaker style panel doors, but this is fine for this project. I just take off a little bit at a time, one blade width, even half a blade width, just until you get that perfectly lined up on each side. I do this for all three of these. Um, I do the top and the bottom first, and I then measure the center and minus half of the thickness of the board to get that perfectly center. I then attach it with the mitre bond and the spray activator, hold it for a few seconds and that's held in place. Because these aren't going to be under any stress, they're not going to be pulled apart or anything like that, the mitre bond holds really well and after they're painted it just finishes it off absolutely perfectly. At this point the camera actually runs out of battery but you get the idea on how to attach the longer rails to these in between the shorter ones. To measure the distance for the hinges I take 6 inches from the top and put a mark there. I take 6 inches from the bottom I put a mark there and then I measure the distance between those two marks and I divide that by one more than the number of hinges that are going there. Because it's two hinges I divide that by three and that helps me space them evenly. After that, I come back with my hinge cutting jig, which is just a, a piece of old door which I cut off and I've glued a piece 90 degree on the front. I line it up and then I start to drill the hole with my hinge cutting bit. The reason I use a hinge cutting bit and not a Forsner bit, even though they're both very, very similar, is the hinge cutting bit has a smaller tip. So if you're cutting a hinge into a 15 mil thick door, a standard Forsner bit will go through and punch a hole through the other side, whereas a hinge cutting bit won't because it's got that smaller point. I then come back across with the hinge cutting bit and I drill all the way through the first 12 mil. You can feel the drill um, skip a little bit once you get through that first one and that's a good enough height for the hinges. After that we come back and we drill the pilot holes through the sides of the jig just so we know where to put the screws in and that keeps the hinges straight. Fitting the hinges is just as simple as using the 12mm screws through the sides into those pilot holes securing the hinges quite nicely. Fitting this door was a little bit difficult because of the angle at the top and because I didn't leave the 24mm space at the side, I left a 15mm space just in my head going off a standard cupboard size and that was a mistake that I ended up paying for here. To fix that I chamfered the front edges of both the door and the panel next to it just to help those close together and I took off a tiny bit of the top of the tip of the angle for the door just to help that fit into place a little bit better. I then offered this into place and screwed the hinges directly into the freebie 2 using the spax screws just to get a better hold. Once that door was in place, I then just used the same method of putting the panel in onto the false door and continued to do that. I then added the panel in onto the drawer front as well, just to finish that off. And that pretty much finished the day for me on the second day. And this is how things looked after day two. I'm really happy, really, really happy with the progress so far. It looks absolutely amazing. All the doors work really well. Um, it's gone much smoother than I thought it would generally. The only issues I had was with that second door. And when I got that sorted, um, I was really happy and really pleased with the results. Okay guys, the third and final day. This is just painting now and to prepare the surface I use some 120 grit sandpaper. I just get this on a roll and I put it on a sanding block 
and just knock off all the sharp edges and I go across all of the end grain of the MDF just to smooth that off as much as I possibly can because that's the hardest part to get a smooth finish on. It just soaks in the paint and the fibers come back out. So you sand it down before painting, you give it a quick sand after the first coat and then it should be perfect for the second and third coat after that. Once you're done with the sanding, just come back with a nice soft brush and brush off all of the corners and the end grain just to get all the sawdust out because you don't want any of that getting into your paint. You want it to be as clean as possible. Even better if you've got a hoover with a brush attachment, just go over it with that and that gets rid of all the dust completely. For the undercoat, I'm using Zinza BIN. This stuff is absolutely amazing. It can undercoat pretty much anything. It's used as a stain blocker and it dries crazy quick. This is a shellac based undercoat. And I'm, when I say it dries really quick, it takes about 15 minutes to dry and it's touch dry about half an hour for a second coat. It was drying so quick that it was drying in the tray I had to keep mixing it in the tray while I was using it. The only issue with this is it's really difficult to clean. So be careful of drips or anything like that. As soon as you've finished using it, make sure you clean it in methylated spirits and that will get things nice and clean for you. When I'm painting, I start off with the edge grain. I just push it into that edge grain really nicely with the brush and then I go back over the same area and leave um, an inch to two inches of brushing across the corner just so I can come back with a mini roller and not worry about hitting those edges. So unfortunately the footage from me masking off the inside and painting the inside corrupted and I completely lost it. The top coat for this I am using Screwfix's non-nonsense quick dry satin paint. This stuff actually covers really really well and it takes about half an hour to dry. Because it's a quick dry it is water based which also means it doesn't yellow over time. So just make sure that the undercoat is completely dry. I went for my lunch and I left this about 45 minutes. Like I say, you can under you can recoat within half an hour of this stuff, especially being outside, it dries super super quick. The top coat, I took two coats of the top coat as well, and like I say, it covers really really well. And two coats was plenty to get a good coverage of all of the surfaces. After all the painting had been finished, I needed to fit these push to open bumpers and to fit these, they were actually quite simple. I unscrew this all the way to see the maximum width and then I screw it halfway back in. So then I've got adjustable front to back. Then you just simply line up the back of the bumper. So where it'd be all the way in to the outer surface of where the cupboard is going to close against. Now you need to have two to three mil more overhang, which is why I adjust this to halfway, which is, it gives you three mil each way then, because you need to be able to push this in before it pops back out again. So when you do fit these, your doors do pop out a little tiny bit uh, when they are closed, they don't sit flush. So if you want your doors to sit flush, then you can't use these push to open connections because you actually need to push them in for it to be able to pop back out again. And as you can see, I actually fitted this before I did the final coats of paint on the two doors that open. I did the final coats on the insides so that I could paint the fronts of them while they're in place and it just saves me worrying them about being outside and maybe it raining it's helpful to have them painted inside and there we go after three long days of hard work 
I think it turned out absolutely amazing. What do you guys think? Do you want to try this project on your own? If you do, let me know down below. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing to follow along for more projects like this in the future. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking around for so long. I know it's been a long video, but hopefully this end result was worth it. Cheers, guys. I'll see you in the next video.